Covenant Church. I'm glad that you could be with us uh, this evening as you come together to hear what God would have for us and what he would have us to be about. A special welcome to all those who are visiting with us for the first time. I'm glad you could be a part of uh, Covenant Church. It is a great place to be. It is a great place to grow in Christ. Uh, we're going to uh, have our reading, our well call to worship, which comes from Zechariah, as we've been talking about it before. Zechariah is a book in the Old Testament that speaks about the return of the exiles from Babylon and back to Jerusalem and how God is going to do that with a mighty hand. But Zechariah as a prophet also speaks of a time when God will be calling his people back to himself uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. And so there is a lot of um, into windows and looking forward to when the Messiah, the promised one, will come and bring us to um, our Father in heaven. And so our call to worship comes from Zechariah chapter 8, and uh, we're going to read it together, uh, those who are here in the congregation, and I will be reading it out loud as well. So from Zechariah chapter 8, starting at verse 2, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts, and so it's anticipation that uh, the new Jerusalem will come and God will be present. And we hear that in Revelation of the new Jerusalem and God being in there in Jerusalem and his son. And there is no temple because the Lord of hosts is that temple. And there is no sun because the glory of the Lord will shine always. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the promises that you have made. Uh, Zechariah reminded us, it is you who is speaking, that you declare these things. You declare that your city will be once thriving again, that you will dwell in your city, and you will be bringing people to you, old men and old women, young boys and young girls, together, the family coming together, multi-generation, gathering together in your city. We look forward to that one day, in anticipation of being together, of the saints of all ages, gathering together in your city. And there we shall see you face to face. And there we shall celebrate all that you have done. And we will celebrate that you have brought us from a very far place and brought us near. Father, we ask for your blessing on your word even now, again. May we hear your word um, in a new way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to begin our time uh, reading from the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. And it is our um, his concluding remarks to us. And so have you here 1 Peter chapter 5, verses one through 11. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will restore himself, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I was in Galesburg, Illinois as an associate pastor. Uh, Galesburg, Illinois is a covenant church there that is the oldest existing covenant church in, the Amer in America. And the senior pastor had retired or had resigned, and we had an interim pastor, Pastor Jim. Well, Pastor Jim and I, we had been working on uh, an event that was taking place. It was to take place in February. And so we were working, plotting, planning. We were getting people together. We were doing this great big event. And actually, I don't remember the event, what it was. But we were preparing for this amazing event. And at the same time, God was preparing a massive snowstorm, ice storm to come at the same time. So that Wednesday, in which the day it was supposed to take place, we had several phone calls. Are, are we still meeting? Are we still going to have it? Should, should we be preparing the food? Should we be getting people lined up? And, and I said... Yes, we're doing it. You know, a weatherman, they all lie all the time and they get paid for it. It ain't happening. Well, that afternoon, Pastor Jim called me into his office and he said, we need to have some conversation. I said, okay. And I was thinking it was about the night and what we were going to do. And he said, my young son, Timothy, uh, I know he had only been there a short time. So I said, um, my name's Todd. And he goes, no, you're Timothy. My young son, Timothy, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, do you think the kingdom of God will be firmly established if we do this event tonight? Or do you think that the kingdom of God will fall completely apart if we do not do this event tonight? Now, I have to say, that's a trick question. No matter how you answer it, you're in trouble. And as I'm thinking about it, he goes, I just want to tell you, Timothy, the kingdom will not even burp over this one. What? What? If you think the kingdom is going to be firmly established because of this event, the kingdom is in a lot worse shape than you think. And if the kingdom is going to fall apart with this event, if we don't do it, the kingdom is a lot worse shape than you think. It's not our kingdom. It's the Lord's kingdom. And it's firmly established, and he's not even going to burp if we do this or not do this. It was a teaching moment. I have to say, I remember that event and being in that office um, in February of 1995. I have no idea what the event was, but that nugget has stayed with me. Have you had somebody, a mentor who has come alongside of you, who has spoken truth into your life, who has maybe spoken about marriage or parenting or about being a spouse? or how to be a follower of Christ, or how to 
something at work? Have you had that someone who has come alongside of you and spoken truth into your life in which it's like you receive this golden nugget and in fact, you, you carry it with you even to this day? If you've had those, and if you've had several who have given you maybe a handful of nuggets, you are truly, truly blessed. For somebody who comes and speaks life into you, that gives you direction, is a truly a blessing from God. And Pastor Jim was that gift. And today, Timothy is that mentor to us. He's going to first speak to me. I'm preaching to Todd for the first part of this sermon because he's talking to me. He's talking to us elders, to those who are pastors. And then he has concluding words for the body of Christ. And he encourages both of us to be faithful to what we have been given and what is expected of us as followers of Christ. He begins in chapter 5, you, you heard that, he began with telling about that he is also a fellow elder. He just says, I, I want to tell you that I am an elder. Now, the word there is presbytos. It means elder, as could be old person, and so I'm talking to you as an old man. But the same word is also used to talk about a leader in the congregation, someone who has been... Um, selected, who has been qualified, and who has been chosen to serve a body of Christ. And, and Peter is reflecting on that he has been chosen by Christ to be a, a leader, a, a servant in the body of Christ. And so he's speaking as the elder who has been chosen. He says, I, I've been an, I'm an elder who has seen the sufferings of Christ. He saw what Christ had gone through. He's also experienced the suffering of what Christ has gone through. And he says, I also anticipate Christ's return of him coming in glory and sharing in that glory because I've been faithful with what he has given me. And so he says, this is where how I'm coming. I'm coming to you as one who has been chosen to serve, who has seen the suffering and experienced the suffering of Christ and who is anticipating Christ to come. And he says, and I want to speak to you, Todd. As a fellow elder, as one who has been selected, who has been qualified, who has been chosen to serve the body of Christ, I want to give you your job description. Shepherd the flock that God has given you and practice or exercise oversight. Shepherd the flock and exercise oversight. Shepherding, he uses the word that is pastor, pastor the flock. A shepherd is somebody, as I understand, and he's telling me, Todd, I want you to, to guide this congregation to a place where they have food and they have water. I want you to guide this, this body that God has given to you to a place where they can sit and rest and be safe and secure. I want you to, to take them over mountains and through valleys and, and rugged terrain, knowing full well that you are bringing them to a place that is where food and water and they can be sheep. Yeah, sheep need to be sheep. They need to be able to frolic. They need to be able to bear wool. They need to be able to have lambs. They need to be able to produce what they have been done. So I want you to shepherd the flock and... It reminds me it's God's flock, not mine. I just want to tell you, people of Trimont, you're not mine. I've been commissioned and selected to shepherd you, but you're God's flock. You're God's sheep. You're God's people. You belong to him. And he says, I want you also to exercise oversight. It's the word we use for bishop. It's Episcopal. I want you to give oversight. You see, God has an expectation of his flock that they're going to produce, that they are going to be doing the work that he's called them to do and put before them. And the shepherd is not only to guide them to food and nourishment and to grow and to mature, but he is also to guide them to places where they are doing the work that he has called them to do. He says, God, I, I, that's what your job is, Todd. 
my young son, Timothy, shepherd and give oversight. And now he says, I want you to also remember to make sure your heart is good on this. You need to have a good heart. And so he has some attitude things here. And if you heard in the passage, he, he puts it with um, uh, two words, not, and he gives an example, and but, and what he wants you to do. So he says, here's three attitudes I want you to have. Not exercise oversight. What? Not under compulsion. Um, he, he was re reminding me, Todd, you were not forced into this position. You were not forced to be a shepherd. You were not forced by Jesus with a headlock to get to Trimont. He says, this is but willingly. You chose out of obedience. Us as shepherds, myself included, we are not coerced into being shepherds. We are invited to be shepherds. And out of obedience to Christ, we serve. I can remember here in Trimont, uh, as we were wrestling with whether or not to come here, I still remember exact place of walking along the road up in uh, northern Minnesota when the Lord spoke to me, when the Spirit said, gave me a word that would be either affirming or denying being coming to Trimont. I remember exact location. And I know when I was here, I heard that exact word from my son as we were leaving Trimont. I knew it before we crossed their railroad, railroad on uh, heading north that it was coming here. It was an act of obedience. He says, so Peter's telling me, Todd, as a shepherd of the flock of Trimont, your heart is one of obedience, willingness. He also says another attitude, not for shameful gain, meaning dishonest or for greed. Um, your job as a shepherd is not to fleece the flock, to use them and abuse them and then take them down. He said, no, it is not for shameful gain, but to do this eagerly. Or it says, with energy and enthusiasm. You see, when you come to serve, he says, I want you to put in your energy and enthusiasm for the flock to that you will care for them and take care of them and that they can produce what they are doing to do the work that they are called to do. You're not doing this to, to line your pockets or to get more resources or to get more land or to be able to have a monument built to yourself. No, it is about serving the body so they can do the work that I've called them to do. And so his attitude is make a check with his attitude. Do you have enthusiasm for the flock? And the third attitude, not domineering over those in your charge. It means to lord it over them. Um, Jesus talked about it, that the rulers of this age lord it over others. Hey, look who I am and respect me, or I can have you do this, or they make you do things because they can do things. You're not called to shepherd the flock so you can do whatever you want, though that is the privilege of the shepherd. It's not to do whatever you want, but it is the opportunity, he says, but to be examples to the flock. Todd, you have been called to be a living flesh, living in the flesh example of Jesus to the people of this congregation. That's your attitude. And so, so Todd, Peter comes and says, my young son, Todd, you've been called to be a shepherd to the flock of God and to give oversight so that they can do the work that I've called them to do. And in your attitude, it must be that of remembering that you were willing to serve, eager, um, a willingness to be obedient. You give it your enthusiasm, energy so that they can do that work and also to be a living example of Jesus. For they need to see Jesus in the flesh. And they need to see that in you. That's a good nugget. That's a lot of nuggets. And so, um, the word is hard. The word is hard and the word is good. And I take it to heart. And he continues... Um, he continues with verse 5, and, it, and it's kind of a strange one, because after he says this, or in verse 4, he says, and then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I know we have a board system, and all systems have structures, 
But he reminds me again that in the midst of being a shepherd and an overseer, it is not to the boards, it is not to organizational structure that um, though I am accountable to them, whom I ultimately am accountable to is Jesus himself, the chief shepherd. And I will have to answer before him and he'll say, so how did shepherding go? How did oversight go? How is it that it was to, to give them examples of what it means to follow Jesus through difficult times? How was it to, to bring the body to places of water and food? How was it to help them to do the work that I set before them, to accomplish those amazing feats only done by the Spirit? I have to answer uh, to Jesus. And I have, taken a, I have to give an honest answer because he knows honestly how it went. And so I'm accountable to Jesus and I will stand before him on behalf of this body of believers. And I will stand before him with the body of, of, from Trimont, or from uh, Galesburg, and from the body from Moose Lake. And you'll say, how did it go? And I'm held accountable for shepherding and oversight. And then he puts in this, and he's talking, I think, believe to other leaders. In verse 5, likewise, you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. This is a tough verse because some think it is talking to the young kids that they need to follow the old people or listen to the old people. Even though elders, uh, presbytos is used, it's not here meaning old men or old women, the elders. It's again meaning um, not the elderly, but the elders, those who are um, given responsibility. I think he's talking about you who are younger, those who are rising up in the congregation as leaders, those who are maybe newer to the faith, those who have been walking with Christ, uh, maybe not as long, those who have been walking with Christ, but leadership is new. He, he is saying, for you that are younger, I want you to submit to the elder, to the elders that I have placed over you. That's a hard word. Um, for all of us, because we are, means that we are submissive to one another and that we are working together on as a team to be the flock of God, to be the people of God, and to do what God has called us to do. And so this first part has been to Todd, okay? My young man, Todd, shepherd the flock and give oversight. And now he includes all of us and says, okay, now the body of Christ, all of you together, pastors, elders, the people, this is what you get to do, okay? And so he goes on, clothe yourselves, all of you, meaning all of it, with humility towards one another. We get to tie on humility. Now, the tie on is actually like the, the impression of putting on an apron or like Jesus, he put a cloth around himself and he washed their feet, but it's... It is that sense of you put something on to keep your clothes from getting stained from what you're doing. It is amazing that when you put on humility, meaning you're putting others before yourself, you are putting yourself in a lower position that when you raise others' interests and in needs and needs, when you raise them, when you put on humility, it keeps you from being stained by being damaged by pride, by self-centeredness, about selfishness, about uh, taking a, a advantage of one another, of manipulation. When you put on humility, you are lifting everyone else up and you're lowering yourself. Which is actually what Jesus did all the time. And so we get to do that together. He's saying, this is what we get to do. All of us get to put on humility like an apron and do the work together. He goes, we also have the ability to cast all our anxiety on God. Now, casting is that sense of throwing a net or if you had a sleeping bag and you've been out, let's say you've been out camping this week and you got all that humidity in your, your sleeping bag and it's sticky wet and you throw it over the clothesline to dry it out. That's the impression that you're throwing it over there and putting it on something else. Casting your anxiety is throwing your anxiety, your fears, onto God the Father. Now, he is saying here in the midst of persecution, 
that when you are suffering for Christ, when you're going through difficult times, when you're being challenged, when you're being pushed, there's going to be all kinds of stuff rising up in you. You're going to go, well, what are we doing this right? Or should we be going in this direction? We've never done it this way before. I'm not sure if we can do this. And all that stuff rises up. And he's not saying, hang on to it. He's not saying, dump it. He's saying, cast it. Throw it on God who loves you very much. We get to do this together. When we're going through unknown territory, when we're going through rugged terrain, when we're going up and down mountains, when we are doing the work and it's challenging and maybe even come against some persecution, those fears that rise up in us, cast them, throw them on upon God because he loves you. Paul will say, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. That's like casting. Let him have it. And if it stays up there for two minutes and you take it back, then you can throw it back up there again and say, God, I give it back to you. Cast, we could do that together. Cast our anxiety on him. The third thing we get to do is resist the devil. Resist the devil. Now, there is a misunderstanding here. Some people think that the devil is almost as strong as or as strong as God himself. He knows everything. He has all powerful. He can be everywhere at all times. That's just not true. The devil, the evil one, is a created being. He is limited by time and space. He is a spiritual being, so he can move around quite quickly but he is limited. He can only be at one place at one time. And he is not all powerful. He has tremendous influence and he has the ears and heart of a lot of people. But he has limited power. He can make circumstances and events take place, but he can't control everything. We're also told that this is his place. He's the prince of this world. So he knows how this system operates. He's created this. All the stuff that we have here, he kind of helped put together. And so he knows how to manipulate it. But together as the body of Christ, we can resist him. How do we resist him? Being sober-minded, being watchful. Sober-minded is having a clear mind, uh, not being intoxicated. Um, and not talking about just alcohol or drugs. It's talking about anything that consumes your mind and gets you to do stinking thinking. So you can have greed and lust. You can have self-centeredness. You can have um, all, anything that's out there that consumes this mind. That is not a clear mind. That's called stinking thinking. I learned that from my, my friends who are alcoholics. You got that stinking thinking going again. When you're stinking thinking, you're not thinking clear. And Satan loves a non-clear mind because when it gets fuzzy up here, he can say anything he wants and you agree with it. Fuzzy thinking is bad. He also says, keep alert. Uh, it's awareness of like that the devil puts slip and slides all over the place. And, and it's all well greased with good Dawn dish liquid. And it's, it's slippery. And he's hoping that as you've got fuzzy thinking and you're walking along and he kind of entices you a little bit there, your feet hit that slip and slide and boom, there you go. And, and there you go down the hill and pretty soon you got shame, guilt and pain and wickedness and you got all that going on and he has you. You and I together are to be clear thinking and be alert. There is a lot of slip and slides around. And he's hoping to catch you at it. He also said, Peter says, we can also resist him. And that is, we get to say, no. No. He cannot take your mind. He cannot take your heart. He cannot take your body unless you give him permission. And when he comes after us, we have the, op we have the ability to say, no. You have no place here. You have no right to be speaking to me that way. You have no words of condemnation because I've been redeemed in Christ. We can say no to him. 
Now he says he's around like a lion and he's out roaring to someone devour. And he will chew up on us. I want you to hear that. He will chew us up if he can. But know this, that you have a father who loves you and your life is always safe in his hands. And so he says that we resist him. You can say no. And then he talks about stand firm in your faith. Satan likes slipping sides. Peter is saying you need to stand firm. It's, it's like standing on a foundation. And that foundation is the word of God. To stand on the word of God because that is strong and sure and sharp and does not sway. We are to stand on the promises of Christ of what he has done on the cross. That he has redeemed you and I. That he has made us a son or a daughter. He has made us a co-heir. He has uh, caused forgiveness to come and our shame and our guilt to be smattered away. We stand on that because the evil one will want to go right after you on that and saying that what you're standing on is false, that what you're holding on to is not good, that your faith is small and wimpy. Stand firm. For even the faith that is small as a mustard seed is able to say to a mountain, be moved, and it is moved. And so I just want to tell you that you can resist the devil by being clear-minded by being alert to what his traps are, to being saying no, and then standing firm on God's word. And, and all of us get to wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. One day he's coming back. And we wait with celebration. We wait with eagerness. We wait with patience. For one day he is coming. And when he comes, we will stand together. And we will stand in his presence and he will say, So, Trimont, how did you do? How was it that you did the work I set before you? How was it in resisting the devil? How was it in serving one another? How was it in submitting to one another? How was it that Pastor Todd was your shepherd? How was it that you were submitting to his leadership? How did it go? And you and I, as the people of Trimont Covenant, we will be together and we get to answer and talk about the stories and events that took place. This is the word of encouragement from Peter. Pastor Todd, I need you to be the shepherd and the overseer of this body of believers. Body of believers, I need you to be in one heart and one mind, submitting to one another, being humble with one another, resisting the devil together, and standing firm together. And when we stand before our Lord, we will stand together, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, and we will speak of the work that the Spirit has done through us. And that will be good work. Let's pray. Gracious God, I just thank you uh, for our mentor, for our, our elder Peter, who comes to us to encourage us as a body of believers. He speaks to leadership. He speaks to the body. Telling us we both have purpose. We both have mission. We both have been called to do great work. Father, I ask for your help. I ask for your help as an elder of this body. I need your help to pastor, to shepherd the flock. I need help with oversight so that they can do the work that you've called them to do. Father, we need your help to do the work that you've called us to do, to be the people of God to one another and to a world that is hurting to go against the evil one and to go against the gates of hell and to break them down because Christ is with us. Father, in the midst of chaos and, and sometimes feeling despair, help us to remember that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is victorious. 
And he is coming back. And when he comes back, it's not, it's not pain and suffering, but it is joy and peace and celebration. For we get to be together with one another and with our Savior. Father, may you be honored in all that happens here. Father, may you gain glory for how things are done. And Father, may we take this nugget, these nuggets of gold, and carry them with us as we live our life in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you um, as the body. May uh, God's word continue to work in you. Uh, I want to tell you that next, next Saturday, I will not be here. Um, and so there will not be a Saturday service. Uh, we will try to get this on Sunday. Um, so if you're looking at this on Saturday, it will not be there. My father is having, my mother and father are having an auction and uh, we will be there uh, next Saturday. And so we'll not get here till late. So um, hope to see you on Sunday. Blessings to you all. Amen.